welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode 158. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons. And as always, I'm joined by the defender of food himself, Mr. Mark Pearson Freeland. Good morning, Mark. Hey, good morning, Mike. I know that you're one to abstain from food early in the morning, but I've got to tell you and our listeners, I've already had some breakfast. So <laughs> I'm sorry to say, sorry to tempt you, but oh. I did I did want to get into the swing of today's topic by starting off with a good old breakfast. And what is your breakfast of choice, Mark? Well, I, I tend to stick to some mostly light breakfasts, I've got to admit, mm-hmm. something not too heavy to get started. So today it was a bit of toast, a bit of egg, um, some pretty mm. honest stuff, you know. There you go. And right now our listeners are thinking, did I tune into the wrong <laughs> podcast? Is this a food and breakfast podcast? Well, it kind of is today, isn't it, Mark? Yeah, it kind of is. Today we're digging into Michael Pollan's In Defense of Food, an Eater's Manifesto. And Mike, just to set the scene for you and our listeners, we're in show number three in our health series. After we've covered Patrick McCowan's The Oxygen Advantage in episode number one, so that was show number 156, as well as last week, Matthew Walker's Why We Sleep, The New Science of Sleep and Dreams. So bearing in mind, we've got a a bit of information about breathing, a bit about sleeping. Today, you and our listeners and me, we're all diving into food. And one of my favorite authors, I have to say, Michael Pollan, uh, the author of In Defense of Food and many, many, many other books uh, around food and healthy diet. Real breakthrough for me, I cannot, um, I cannot encourage our listeners more than to just jump in, grab this book, uh, enjoy this show for, for as a, like a taster of what's to come from Michael Pollan. Um, I, I really found this for anybody who just wants to eat well, feel well, and be at their best. This, this book not only gives you like the roadmap, it sets the context, Mark, and it is a huge wake-up call. So as we get to the end of 2021, and you might be a little bit tempted over the Christmas break to overindulge, um, sure, enjoy a moment with friends and some real treats. But as we turn into the new year of 2022, if there was ever a time that we wanted to focus on health, it's now. And I think this book, In Defense of Food, is on one hand, like a fantastic roadmap of how to think about your own diet, what you eat, what you put into your body. But some of us need a little bit of a wake up call and Mark, Michael serves it up in this book, doesn't he? Yeah, Michael's going to not only help us reevaluate what it is that we're purchasing as well as we're putting into our bodies, but don't worry, listeners, he does have some proactive tips for us. And it's not all doom and gloom. Nobody has to put down the knife and fork and start starving yourself. This is not a diet podcast. We are not a diet show. We're all about how to transform ourselves into the best version of ourselves. And I think if we look across the health series, Mike, we've understood a lot more about the effects of breathing and how we can take control of that, as well as maximize our ability to you know, be unconscious when we go to sleep and have a good night's rest. Today, it's about food. We all love it. So let's make sure we understand it and start to take proactive choices when we're evaluating what it is that we're going to start consuming. Well, Mark, I'm hungry for his thinking. Let's dive into the world of In Defense of Food by Michael Pollan. Where do you want to start? I want to start with a mantra that our listeners may well already be aware of. It's something, in fact, Mike, that we've referenced a couple of times on the Moonshot show in the past. So I want to give the author a chance, Michael Pollan, a chance to help define what it is that he's pretty well known for on the back of In Defense of Food and all of his series on food. And this mantra is eat food, mostly plants, not too much. So let's hear from Michael breaking down this manifesto. Michael, you use a simple framework for delivering a lot of your advice on how to approach one's relationship with food. And what comes to mind is your kind of mantra, 
eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Yeah. Well, you know, coming up with those seven words, which I'm afraid will be on my gravestone unless I don't, <laughs> unless I come up with something better soon, um, is uh, is the result of a very long process of examining the science of nutrition. But as I got deeper and deeper and deeper, I realized, well, actually, the key issue is: Are you eating real food? or what I like to call edible food-like substances, which is to say processed foods. And so the phrase, eat food, I realized that's really what you need to know to eat well. Eat food, by which I mean real food. But then I realized that isn't quite enough because we're also eating too many calories. So not too much became part of the mantra. And then lastly, I was like, well, within the range of foods, is there a class that's better than another class? And one of the things we know is that people who eat lots of plant foods tend to have much better health and better longevity than people who eat a heavy meat diet. So mostly plants, not all plants, mostly is I'm, I'm trying to be very reasonable. And, and um, although it tends to offend both vegetarians and carnivores when you say mostly plants. So eat food, not too much, mostly plants is basically, I think all you need to know. Now, eat food is probably the hardest part of that to understand because isn't all that stuff in the supermarket food? Well, I would argue it's not, and I would argue a lot of it are relatively new, highly processed, edible food-like substances that really are what gets most people into trouble around eating. They tend to have lots of refined sugars, lots of refined fats, and very little fiber, very little of the antioxidants you find in plants. And basically, they were designed for long shelf life, these processed foods. And um, the way you make a food last longer is you take out what is nutritionally valuable. I'm talking about omega-3 fatty acids. I'm talking about fiber. All these things don't store well. So we've gone down a path of, of eating a lot of things that shouldn't be dignified with that beautiful word, food. Wow, that that really is right between the eyes, or, or <laughs> perhaps it's a bit of a, a belly blow, um, uh, a gut shot. Um, eat food, mostly plants, not too much. And Mark, I know we have mentioned this many times on the the many years of this show, but I want to stress to our listeners that what Michael Pollan offers in his book, In Defense of Food is these three aha moments, which is realize, listeners, that often what we think is food is so full of preservatives that in order to preserve the food, you must remove the food. (laughs) Mm. So he's basically saying make sure you're eating stuff that is actually food and What I love about this next part of the mantra is he says mostly plants. So he's not like, hey, fellas, everyone's got to go vegan. No, Mm. he's like mostly plants and like, you know, make sure it's green, make sure that you're eating things that have fiber in them. And lastly, and this is huge for Western culture, not too much. Like our portions are crazy. Absolutely crazy. So uh, I have a funny story to tell you. So I had just moved to the US after living in uh, in uh, London, and uh, I ordered a a smoothie. And they and I think the 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 person at the counter said, "Do you want do you want like a regular or a large?" And I was like, really wanted to have like a healthy smoothie. It was the day I just arrived in, in SF. And they handed me what was, I think, a 16-ounce smoothie that was so big, I actually couldn't hold it with one hand. I needed two hands to hold it. And because I'd been in Europe where the portion sizes are smaller than the U.S., I was just so shocked at the size of this smoothie. And it's really a call to arms from Michael Pollan to create a moment just like I described, like, Make sure what you're eating is actually a food. Make sure it's most of the time it's kind of plant. And lastly, hold on to those portion sizes and just calm down with the uh, those massive 
buckets of beverage or like platters of food. Like take it easy and eat food, mostly plants, not too much, is a mantra that I can encourage you, Mark, and all of our listeners, hold on to it because, yeah, it, its beauty is in its simplicity and its power. Pretty good stuff, right? Yeah, I, and I think you're right. It, it, it is actually pretty simple. I think that's really the thing that stands out to me in Michael Pollan's In Defense of Food. They're very actionable. They're very ownable by us when we make conscious decisions about what we're purchasing and what we're eating. And they it's a mantra. It's only seven words. It's a mantra that you can bear in mind when you're considering what it is that you're going to, to serve or what you're going to order. And for me, I, I certainly fall down on, on one of those of the three mantras, which we'll discuss <laughs> later. Um, but, I, but I quite like the, the mostly plants element. Again, building on what you were just saying, it's not Michael saying we will have to turn vegan. He's not encouraging us necessarily to step entirely away from, from uh, you know, meat-based. So we're not here, listeners, to uh, campaign against those who are eating meat. Instead, what I think stands out to me with the mostly plants element, it's because you can identify it as real food. You can see that a piece of kale or cauliflower is indeed a bit of kale or cauliflower. Whereas sometimes, especially when you're grabbing something, you know, convenience food, fast food, it's tough to really identify what it is. So I think this idea of eating the real food as opposed to how Michael describes a kind of edible uh, fake version of food, it's a lot easier to do with plants, I think. And I think that's what really stands out to me when I'm considering Michael's work uh, in the rest of the show, as well as specifically in that mantra, it's mm. being able to identify it, identify yeah. the food that you're eating. I think uh, what Michael Pollan is encouraging us to do is to just remember this simple mantra. And when he says eat food, just like when in doubt, if it's in a package, right, that's like a huge cue. Uh, if it's not just sitting there as a fresh uh, head of broccoli, like if it's in a package, question, right? That's what he's saying. If it's full of preservatives, um, be careful here because if your grandma has got this great thing, like if your grandma wouldn't recognize the ingredient, that's a huge trigger moment like, mm, do you really need to be eating this? So. Very interesting foundational idea here. First principle, eat food. Now, the next thing on the not too much, the reason that he's saying don't uh, overindulge, watch those portion sizes, is re the reality is as you put on weight, your risk of heart disease and diabetes increases. Simple scientific truth. But hey, in the end of the day, we all. Forget, um, you know, the, the, the tension and the pressure we feel around body image. I would just go to think how good you feel when you feel lean for whatever your size and shape is, when you're not heavy. You know, I've had these times in life where I've really felt heavy and beyond the fact that you feel like I'm a, you know, I felt like I was a bit of an oaf. Um, and too heavy and, and, and the, you know, whatever unsightliness comes with that in my mind, more, th it's more than that. I would say when I feel lean, I feel good. I feel mobile, flexible, agile. Like I feel like a greater sense of flow. I don't know how to describe it, Mike. How do you feel when you're like feeling nice and lean and not like all heavy? Um, do you ever have this kind of experience? Yeah. My, <clears throat> Excuse me. The the experience that I will portray because it's this time of year, Mike. We've got Christmas trees up. We're all getting ready to maybe purchase all the food and start serving it. I will fall into the camp of eating a lot, and that's not <laughs> because I am uh, uh, necessarily trying to be polite. I'm not trying to eat the food that somebody's serving me. I'm just a bit greedy. So the way that my body, as well as my mindset changes when I do eat a lot, I get very sleepy. 
very, very <laughs> tired. Right? And that's okay. Totally, totally. But what I do notice is when I have, have had that big meal, suddenly I don't want to interact with lots of other people. I want to maybe even go to the extreme and go and have a lie down. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I just feel very heavy and lethargic. You know, it just yes. slows me right down. And I can really I totally notice it, it when I eat too much. So to build on that, what I've done is I've removed breakfast from my diet because I feel so lean. And so, um, because my body's not d- diverting all this energy to my stomach to, to process and digest, I can send that, that blood, that energy to different places like my brain. So that's why I feel like I do my best work in the morning. That's why we record the show in the morning because we're sharp and, and, you know, with it. And the last part is the mostly plants thing. You know, let me just say this. I love a good steak. Let's get this super clear. I love meat, but particularly as I'm starting to get a little bit of gray hair and getting in my uh, more senior years, what I would propose to you is I notice that when I eat vegetarian, I'm putting less workload on my body. Um, So therefore I have more energy and I feel good, light, clean, bouncy is a good way of describing it. And I will always, each week I'll eat meat. Don't worry about that. But my point is I've actually moderated my meat intake just because I feel, feel good when I eat mostly plants as Michael Pollan would recommend. And one of the things I take great pride in is saying to myself, you know, first meal of the day, it should be a green plant. So I love having spinach, um, you know, at 11 or 12 o'clock. Um, I love, um, just getting fresh veggies into me and feeling good. So eat food, not too much, mostly plants. I mean, Mark, I think we could almost do the whole show on the mantra. I mean, it, <laughs> we can, we can throw all the clips away. I mean, there's so much in it, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. I, th- I think you're totally right. We could totally just revolve around those seven key words because they are the real fundamental of what Michael's really calling out to us and giving us and our listeners and his readers a chance to go out and do. And and I think, again, it just comes down to the ownership being on us. We can totally. control what it is that we put into ourselves. And just sticking by those seven key words, that little mantra is is a way to to not only control your your weight, but also more importantly, as you've just said, that level of efficiency focus, productivity, and the feeling that you're just in a good place at the start of the day, but all the way through the rest of the day as well. Yeah, totally. Now I tell you who likes being at their best, Mark, and that's our members. What do you reckon? Yeah, that's right. It's time listeners and members who are joining us for our Patreon roll call. Drum roll, please. We are welcoming new listeners and members as well, Mike, this week. And I want to give a special shout out to Spaceman, who has joined us and become (laughs) the Patreon member. Thank you and welcome, Spaceman. But also not to forget all of our members who have been with us for many, many weeks. I'm calling out Yasmin, Rodrigo and Connor, Marjan and Yaniv, Helena, Mark, Byron, Tom, Dietmind, Ken, Sandy, Niall, Bridie, Terry, John, Nils and Bob. Welcome, members. We're so pleased to have you with us every single week and every single month. And if uh, if you think about what special diet those members are on, by being members, uh, they get to digest every month the Moonshots Master Series, Mark, and that is a heavy-duty members-only podcast. And if you'd like to get your hands onto that, head over to moonshots.io, become a member, hit that big button, know that by becoming a member, You help us pay all of our hosting costs. And when we get on the other side of that, we can actually build a mobile application so you can, on your phone, get all the wisdom of moonshots uh, in the palm of your hand. But I tell you who's been busy typing away on their iPhones and on their computers is some of our members, Mark, that deserve a special shout. That's right. A special shout out to Mr. Terry Bean, who once again is advocating on the Moonshot Show over on LinkedIn. Thank you, Terry, for always joining us. In fact, I think we should give an extra, extra call out and a round of applause even, Mike, for Terry, because... 
Terry's been a very, very busy man, not only digesting and listening and learning out loud with us on the Moonshot Show, but it sounds as though he's also been giving himself some pretty physical goals with doing press-ups every single day as well. So well done, Terry. Yeah. Now you you have to give a little bit more context here, Mark, because uh, Terry did a classic thing you can do at moonshots.io. He went into the back catalogue and he re-listened to one of our faves, David Goggins, and he got a little fired up, right, Mark? I mean, he's been hitting push-ups every single day and it nearly blew me away. Do you, why don't you share with our listeners what's the highest number of push-ups he's done? Thanks to the Moonshots podcast, we've just he's just leapt into action. How many push-ups did he do in one single day? It blows my mind, <laughs> but Terry has somehow, Mike, Superman Terry, maybe he's Superman who's joined us. He's managed 390 press-ups. In a single yes. day, I'm I, my my shoulders are hurting just contemplating this thought. It is phenomenal. So shout out to Terry, and also shout out to to Kushi, who is based um, uh, out there in uh, the uh, exotic world of India, and she came up with this really good uh, idea, which I kind of agree with. Is that she says here, I prefer podcasts over YouTube videos, unless she's after technical. Uh, really technical content. She goes on to say, for me, they are reliable sources of staying updated, escaping FOMO, and a go-to choice while eating or traveling long distances. And then big big respect to, to Kushi. She actually lists us in the company of the Financial Times, uh, <laughs> the Economic Times, and there she puts Learning Out Loud by Moonshots Podcast is one of her favorite shows. So Kushi, respect and love coming to you across the Pacific Ocean to you right there in India. We really do appreciate the shout out, don't we, Mark? Wow. Well, thank you, Kushi, for listening. And thank you for listening to us in such high esteemed podcasts as well. I do agree, consuming uh, podcasts while you're out and about or, or sitting down and even eating. I think today's show, particularly Kushi, will rest in your, uh, your catalog there as you're consuming your next meal. Absolutely. And I tell you what, now that we have kind of topped up on all the the love and the sharing and the conversations that our members are doing, I think it's appropriate to consider the next part of Michael Pollan and In Defense of Food. But Mark, I think what we want to do is we want to hit our listeners with a question. And when you hear this question, we want you not only to think about your answer, but to share it. Go uh, and share it on Twitter. So, you know, just look up Moonshots uh, podcast and you'll find us on Twitter, on YouTube, on Patreon, wherever you want. We want to invite you to answer the following question. Drum roll, Mark, what is the question that we're asking every single listener right now on this show? What is the one food and direct habit you want to change? Hmm. So it could be, I mean, there are so many things. Maybe you want to eat mostly food. Maybe it's mostly plants. Maybe it's not too much. In fact, we've got a whole bunch of recommendations coming up that might get you into the idea of a positive habit that you might start something positive in your life. So what's the one food or, or you know, diet habit that you want to change? Let's think about this while we jump into Michael Pollan. And the next clip we have is some really powerful thinking that he has on this idea of the religion of nutrients. The way we were looking at food, which is to say this pseudoscientific way we all look at food, that was really making our lives difficult and not helping our health. And I call this way of looking nutritionism. And I want to talk a little bit about nutritionism, which I think has, is, is, is a good name for the ideology that organizes our thinking about food. Now, an ideology is a, is a kind of, uh, it's an interesting thing. Um, it's the set of ideas and assumptions that organize your experience of something, your understanding of something, usually without you being aware of it at all. Okay? It's kind of deep 
its deep-seated set of premises that you don't even, um, you know, consider, question, criticize, because they just seem so obvious. So let me, let me walk you through the four premises that I think define nutritionism. And you can tell me if this doesn't characterize the typical American way of thinking about food today and perhaps your own way of looking about food today. And then I'll try to get you to expunge it from your brains and replace it with something that I think will be healthier and happier. Okay, the first premise of nutritionism is that the important thing about any food is the nutrients it contains. That food is essentially the sum of its nutrient parts. So that when you're thinking about eating a steak, it's really a matter of saturated fat and protein. And um, if you walk through the supermarket today, you will be kind of amazed to see, you know, yeah, you can still find cereal on the label or yogurt, but look at all the other biochemistry that is bannered in the store. Uh, you know, it, the, the vocabulary of food is about cholesterol and fiber and phytochemicals and antioxidants. Um, and we all have this, this nu nutrient vocabulary knocking around in our heads. This is very peculiar. Where else in your life your everyday life, not your professional life? Do you have so many scientific terms in your head? So that's the first premise, that nutrients are what matters. Food is, food is basically delivery systems for nutrients. Premise number two, if nutrients are what matters in food and nutrients are invisible to all except the, uh, the nutrition scientist with his or her microscope, if you can't see a nutrient, if you can't taste a nutrient, if you can't smell a nutrient, then you need experts to tell you how to eat, right? As soon as you enshrine the nutrient as the important thing, and since we don't, we don't have a, a, a sensory experience of nutrients, suddenly you need experts. You need journalists, you need doctors, you need nutritionists, you need uh, scientists uh, to tell you how to eat. It's a little like a religion, right? If you have a religion where the important thing is invisible, is, a, is an abstract uh, you know, deity to whom we no longer communicate directly, we, our relationship to that deity must be mediated by a priesthood. And today we have a food priesthood that basically tells us how to eat. So that's premise number two. We need experts in order to eat. Very interesting, Mike. I think it's a fascinating little breakdown from Michael Pollan in his book, In Defense of Food, because it's something that I think I've certainly been guilty of. I certainly take a look at the bodies that um, control or at least direct how I uh, interpret and what I purchase and what I put into my body. And I think this idea around nutrients and uh, science being able to influence and control what it is that I'm putting into my body, it's a mm. little bit scary with how much trust I put into those bodies. Well, you know, what, what Poland is beautifully doing here is like, don't fall victim to like, Oh, is it, is it organic? Is it a superfood? Because once you start going down these, uh, these lines, you, you're just in the hands of what's the fad today. It's almost like the, the, the diet movement. It's this diet this year, that diet, uh, the next year, what Michael is saving us from is all of this obfuscation and distraction. He's like, everybody eat food, mostly plants not too much. So he is saving us from all these technical scientific questions that can just be a big trap. And he's saying, guys, just eat the real stuff. Yeah, try and get, you know, lots of good green stuff and veggies in there. And you know what? Take it easy on the portions. I mean, Mark, that just feels good saying versus like, is it high cholesterol? Is it high fiber? Is it a superfood? Is it organic? Like he's just getting us back to basics, isn't he? Yeah. And I, this is what I really like about what Michael's breaking down for us, because it is pretty overwhelming in my experience, particularly in a world where we're very, very connected and we can Google or search or look up any new terms that you might find on your food, whether it's probiotic or added calcium, whatever it might be. <laughs> and you, you tend to fall into the camp of, okay, well, it sounds impressive. So I should probably eat this one. When the truth right. is, I have no idea what it is. <laughs> it, it, exactly. And, and um, actually, this is the start. Uh, of where he's saying, take back control. 
eat food, mostly plants, not too much. And he continues this story, um, this sort of second part to this idea when he talks about um, the good and the evil of healthy eating. Third premise, like a great many other isms, ideologies, nutritionism divides the world into good and evil. So at any given time in our dietary history, there is a satanic nutrient we are trying to drive from the food supply. Today, it's the trans fat. For a long time, it was saturated fats. Um, uh, and then, and, but if you go back further in history, it's very interesting to see that the, that the role assigned to the evil nutrient is constantly changing. If you go back 100 years to that, the, this moment of food fatism characterized by John Harvey Kellogg and Horace Fletcher. These were the great food experts of the turn of the last century. They had the sanitarium at Battle Creek, Michigan, where all the elites of their times, uh, you know, Henry Ford, William James, Henry James, they would go there to be treated for the their food issues and um, and very bizarre. Horace Fletcher believed you had to um, you had to chew every bite a hundred times and that that was the key to health. And they wrote these special rousing chewing songs to to inspire people because try chewing something a hundred times. It takes a really long time. You will lose weight uh, <laughs> because you're not doing anything else. Um, and they had these. Uh, hourly yogurt enemas for people. Uh, they had, I mean, it was just bizarre food practices and it was considered like state of the art science. At the time, the great nutritional evil was protein. They felt protein, which now of course is a nutritional good, um, that, uh, it was the worst thing for you. It would ruin your life. So in fact, that's why we have breakfast cereal. Kellogg became Kellogg of Kellogg cereal and cereal was invented to push protein off of the, the, the out of the morning meal and enshrine the carbohydrate. Okay, so the identity of the evil changes. And then on the other side, if you have an evil nutrient, you need a good nutrient. Okay, it's kind of like the Cold War. So there's a there's a good nutrient, and the identity of that is always changing. What's the good nutrient today? Well, it's the omega-3 fatty acid, right? I mean, that is the blessed nutrient. You get enough of that, you're going to be happy. You're going to not have heart disease. You're going to live forever. Um, and there are other good nutrients. Well, protein is kind of coming back. Um, uh, carbohydrates are going out. They're kind of evil again. Um, and fiber, of course, has had a nice long run as a, as a blessed nutrient. So um, we've had, uh, you know, so this is how we divide the world. And if we get enough, the key to health is getting enough of the good nutrients and avoiding enough of the bad nutrients, and then everything will be fine. And it's kind of the zero-sum game. Fourth premise of nutritionism. Now, that may not seem controversial to you. Fourth premise of nutritionism, and, and perhaps this is the weirdest, um, but we take this for granted, that the whole point of eating is health. That it's what it's about. It's what's at stake when we eat. It's all about health. Now, this is a very American idea. It's not held by a lot of people elsewhere in the world. Historically, it hasn't been held by a lot of people. People have eaten for a great many other reasons besides an obsession with their health. They eat for pleasure. They eat for community, for family, what happens around the table. Very, very important reason to eat. They eat for um, uh, ritual purposes. There's always been a, you know, religious reasons we eat this, and it's part of our religious practice. They eat for, um, uh, to express their identity. Every food culture has a set of taboos. Um, we're the people who don't eat this. We don't eat pork. Or we don't eat meat. Um, so identity is a very important reason to eat. All these other reasons for eating are equally legitimate to this single-minded obsession with health. Um, and our obsession with health, our reduction of eating, this incredibly rich, interesting experience that engages us with the natural world, that engages us with other people, to narrow it down to the, you know, this, 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 this aperture of this obsession with health, it hasn't made us any healthier. What wow. a fascinating little <laughs> breakdown, Mike. <laughs> oh, do you know where he really got me was like protein. And I'm like... Because protein's a big thing. I've been guilty of being like very po protein positive. And he's like, well, back in the day, protein was the enemy. It was all about the carb. And then you realize that's the whole catch with this nutritionism and this religion of, of nutrients. 
he's proposing like sit together, eat food, mostly plants, not too much. It's that <laughs> simple. And God, he made a good case for it then, didn't he? Yeah, it's it's really, really funny when you've got an individual who's spent so many years analyzing the food industry, the science of food, and you're able to take a step back and look at the patterns that have existed over the course of the last, even the last century. And seeing this almost marketing effort from not only the brands, but also the scientists behind the brands, creating these narratives in order to control what it is that we're purchasing for us and as well as our families. It's a fascinating little moment of aha or realization, isn't it? Because Mm -hmm. suddenly you realize, oh, I don't really have much control over what I'm purchasing because I'm being influenced by all of these scientists and all of these brands in order to purchase the food that they themselves are putting out. So my level of control until now has kind of been completely uh, influenced for me. And, you know, in this last clip, Mike, when we hear about the point of food be, uh, and the point of eating being healthy, I've certainly fallen into that camp before Well, where I'll in- instinctively choose things that don't really sound that appealing, but it sounds healthy. And it sounds as though that's the sort of thing I should have. Whereas what he's really calling out to us is, yeah, it's all good. Just eat good food, eat honest food. Most of those plants, not too much. Just keep it simple rather than overcomplicating it like we've experienced with brands and marketing. So hopefully now for you, myself, and all of our listeners, we've made the case um, for, you know, eat food, mostly plants, not too much. What we're going to do in a moment is look into how we can actually make that a habit, how we can actually do that at the grocery store, at the restaurant, at home, in the kitchen, and together with friends. But I tell you what, it is just the moment before we do that is to celebrate the expanding mega empire of the Moonshots media landscape. And Mark, if you're loving the Moonshots podcast and you're listening to this and all the far reaches of the world, it was so great to see that um, where we got a lot of love over the course of this year on Spotify was Kenya, Nigeria, Zambia, Nepal, and Ghana. Mark, how cool is that to know that we have listeners tuning in from all four corners of the planet? It's an amazing year as we reflect on it, Mike, isn't it? Having listeners coming at us from all four corners of the globe, as particularly these brand new countries for us, it's really exciting. And we're so pleased to welcome all of you listeners into the Moonshots family. But Mike, you're right. We now have this opportunity to offer our listeners the chance to sign up and subscribe right directly in the Apple Podcast app to the Master Series. Mm. And we're about to record a new one next week, aren't we? That's right. Next week, we're digging into the art of communication, which follows already five big monthly episodes, Mike, that we release just for our subscribers and our members on areas and topics such as motivation, teamwork, the idea of circle of influences and ways of thinking and frameworks to be more efficient and productive. And these are really deep dives, comprehensive breakdowns of these pretty enormous topics, Mike, that we touch upon in our weekly shows on the Moonshots podcast. But having the ability to release to our members as well as our subscribers on Apple Podcast, 90-minute deep dives into each of these topics is a real opportunity for us to bring something brand new into the space. It takes learning out loud to a new level. So if you're listening right now on your Apple podcast app, I want you to open it up and just go into the search and type Moonshots Master Series. And you can take a trial. uh, So you don't have to pay any money. You can just check it all out. You can listen to all the episodes. And if you like it, we would really appreciate your support. So whether you want to support us in your Apple podcast app, or whether you want to support us by becoming a member on Patreon, we deeply appreciate it. We're really grateful for that support. It helps us build the show and produce it and send it out to over 45,000 people a month, which is absolutely crazy. But you know where else gets crazy, Mark? Uh, That is this concept of the supermarket. And when we think Michael Pollan and in defense of food, there's not a lot that gets crazier than trying to navigate a supermarket, is there? 
Yeah, that's right. Whether you go in and you get confused and lost like I do from a layout perspective, or in fact, you get lost when you're looking at the back of the food packets when you're putting it into your cart. What Michael Pollan, as well as Michael Moss, are going to break down and discuss for us in this next clip, Mike, is how to navigate home cooking as well as when you're in the supermarket purchasing food. So let's hear from Michael Pollan once again with the failure, in fact, of the Western diet. Americans spend about half as much time cooking as they did in the 1960s, relying more than ever on highly processed foods. The New York Times brought together noted food journalists Michael Moss and Michael Pollan. Oh my God, we got to get some of these. To talk about home cooking, the food industry, and navigating a typical supermarket. You know, this seems like such a tranquil atmosphere here. Quiet, right. there's peaceful music, smells okay, but behind these shelves, is the most fiercely competitive industry there is. They are all jockeying for position on the shelf. They are fighting each other for stomach share, that they call. Both authors have recently published books. Michael Moss investigates the development and marketing of food products in salt, sugar, fat. And Michael Pollan rediscovers his own kitchen in Cooked. You know, a lot of people, when they hear this term processed food, Assume it's all the same right. and it's all equally bad. Right. And, and it's actually not true. There are processed foods that are one or two or maybe three ingredient processed foods. And then there are these things we call ultra processed or hyper processed foods. Right. Uh, Lunchables, we have to yeah, say something oh, this about this. is a great product. Well, right? You should talk about this. Oscar Mayer first came up with this idea because back in the 80s they were having trouble selling red meat. They put their geniuses together and they were actually marketing people to look at a way of repackaging their essential ingredients. So they started with the red meat um, and then added cheese when they merged with craft. They used crackers because they couldn't uh, use bread. And then they came up with this great kind of school bus yellow motif for the package. By Kraft's own acknowledgement, it's not about the food as much as it is about the empowerment. All day, you got to do what they say. But lunchtime is all yours. And look at the number of ingredients. This is a hyper-processed food. How do you feel about frozen vegetables and frozen uh, Well, that's, this again goes to that distinction between processed food uh, and ultra processed food. I think frozen vegetables are a uh, are terrific, mm -hmm. and I always have um, frozen spinach. And this is a really simple product. Mm -hmm. It's basically spinach. Here's a case where I would buy uh, organic, but I don't see it. And and that's an important point. It's more important that you eat vegetables, even if they're conventional. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about for your health, mm -hmm. than it is that you wait till you can afford organic mm -hmm. or you can find organic. This is a real convenience food that I think genuinely is a is a boon to mankind. Okay. <laughs> so we'll get one of those. Okay, stony field, low fat, fruit on the bottom. This has 21 grams of sugar <laughs> per six ounces. So there is this chip And this is organic, by the way. This is the, the illustrates the point you were making earlier. And this is probiotic. Got probiotics. That's another magic word. Yeah. But it has 26 grams of sugar. This has wow. more sugar in it than Coca-Cola. So I once asked a uh, yogurt manufacturer. 14, by the way. Why you don't have the equivalent of honest tea for yogurt, like for adults who don't want to be swamped with sugar right. or don't want to give their kids sugar. Right. Um, and, he, and he explained to me how the pressure, the arms race to get more and more sugar in is irresistible. If your competitor has more sugar, they're going to sell more yogurt. So you have to match them. There was a company I ran into that put a ticker tape of the, showing their stock price in the lobby so their employees could see it every, every morning when they wow. came to work so they would know what was... Yeah. Most important, yeah. right? Wow. But they're playing, of course, with these very deep desires we have that we we don't have that much control over, yeah. and those are the the levers that they're manipulating yeah. constantly. Who? I mean, the, the, when you realize they're looking at organic yogurt, and it has more sugar than Coke, I, I this really hit me to just the just that how you have to be careful of this nutritionalism. And, you know, he gives us some, some great rules that we're going to talk about in a second, but this is why we have to like take control of our diet, isn't it, Mark? 
Mm, I mean, a huge amount of sugar and, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of sugar for sure, Mike. It's totally irresistible for me as well. And it's, isn't it funny hearing these two navigating the supermarket, calling out what they're yeah. seeing on the back of yeah. the, the, the products. And you think, yeah, probiotic yogurt, that sounds good. It's a buzzword I've heard before. It must be mm. good for my gut. I'm going to be really healthy. But without having that moment of pause and checking what's on the side, you know, we're all going to fall into the camp of, of consuming more sugar than Coca-Cola. I mean, that's enormous. Oh, I mean, that is just shocking. So I think it's now time, Mark, that we go one level deeper into this mantra. And uh, Poland has, you know, some some great wisdom for us that he builds. Um, and I want you and I to kind of go back to back here, right, um, and look at these rules that I think are very helpful for us and for our listeners. If we want to eat food, mostly plants, not too much. Here's Michael Pollan's golden rules that are in his book, In Defense of Food. Okay, Mark, you ready? I'm ready. Okay, first one. So he's. this is just, we're just going to break down like some simple things, some simple rules and habits you can have. Eat only foods that will eventually rot. Now, do you remember uh, in the Super Size Me film when uh, Morgan Spurtlock left the fries for a month and they didn't yes. decompose? Yes. And, right? and this people, is what this one's talking about. Yeah. People have, have even preserved hamburgers in their mm. cupboards or mm -hmm. whatever for years mm -hmm. and they barely degrade. Okay. Don't eat that stuff. Okay. Your turn. Eat only foods that have been cooked by humans. So once, ag once again, you know, like you start to realize, mm, particularly on that takeout stuff or maybe some of those quick microwave meals that we take, we have to question that. I love this one. This one's going to make life hard. Avoid foods you see advertised on television. <laughs> that, one's, that one's really hard, isn't it? <laughs> well, you, you know where I think he's going with that one. It's like um, all the packaged processed foods have to advertise on television. Like you don't mm. see an ad for, for broccoli or. Um, I, I've never seen an ad for broccoli or cauliflower. Or Brussels before. sprouts. <laughs> what about Brussels sprouts? You ever seen an ad for that? <laughs> no, and I love Brussels sprouts. The, all right, come the, on, let's keep the good habits going. What do we got? We, the next one we've got treat meat as a flavoring or special occasion food. So only once every so often, or maybe just yep. use it to add that little bit of flavor into your cooking. That's a good one. Yeah. And just on that, there's a little side note in the book, which is kind of cool, um, where he says, prefer no legs over one, right? I.e. go for some fish. If you can't do that, prefer two legs over four. So once again, you see what he's doing. He's like, you know, beef has to be a, a really special occasion. Um, chicken, a bit more. Fish, even better. So you see that little scale there that he gives us to help us? Mm. All right. That's Is really it my go? Handy. It's your go. Okay, here we go. If it came from a plant, eat it. If it was made by a plant, don't. I have no idea what he's talking about. Well, I, th I think, I think, Mike, what's that saying is if it came from a plant, you know, vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, then that's okay. But if it was made in a plant, like a factory, then don't oh. because it's processed. It's a nice little play on words, that one. So I'm still thinking, does he mean eat the leaves, not the fruit? But that doesn't make sense. Glad you helped me. Glad you helped <laughs> me. All right, next. Eat your colors. That is, eat as many different kinds of plants as possible. A makes nice total, variety. Makes, yeah. That's good. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Use smaller plates and glasses. Oh, my gosh. That's something that I have to do. I have that's to a do. hard one. That's mm. a hard one. The next one, which I really like, serve the vegetables first. First on your plate, first in the, in the process of dinner, having your vegetables first. Because I guess, Mike, you end up kind of getting fuller quicker. So maybe you eat less yeah. meat. So we used this trick, uh, with our son when he was younger, where we, we'd give him like, uh, you know, cucumbers and carrots before dinner. And that's a little trick for getting your kids to eat healthy because once they see, um, you know, some fries, potatoes yeah, and, and some chicken on the, on the thing, they'll go for that. And then they'll be like, I'm too full. Yes. 
Yes. Um, okay. Uh, next one, uh, make water your beverage of choice. Huge believer in this one. I'm totally sold on that. Um, what's next? Yep. I'm totally sold on that one too. I'm glad I got to read this one out because this is my going back to our question listeners Mm. of what Mm. diet habit you'd want to change. This next one from Michael Pollan is stop eating before you're full. Mike, I am so guilty of this one. I will eat until I'm bursting. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And uh, one of the the things that came up so far in the show was actually just eat slower and it it Mm. becomes... Uh, you actually start to realize you're full because the, I believe technically it's uh, a 15 minute delay between eating and feeling uh, the appropriate level of satiation. So if you can just take your time, you'll actually not feel like eating the food. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, eat more like the French do, uh, which is they just take a lot more time to eat than the average American, almost twice as much time spent eating. And it's not the volume, but it's the time together letting you actually letting yourself feel full rather than hoofing it all down. That's a good mm. one, isn't it? Yeah. And this next one as well, the food rules, try to spend as much time enjoying the meal as it took to prepare it. Again, Mike, I'm pretty guilty <laughs> of this. We'll, we'll spend maybe an hour or so making a nice dinner on the weekends and you finish it within five or 10 minutes. And there's that value exchange is sort of out the window. So I really like that one. Spend as much time enjoying it as it took to prepare it. I know. That's a good one. Equally good. Second last one. Don't eat anything your great grandmother wouldn't recognize as food. That's that's a bit of a game changer right there, isn't it? Yeah. A nice, honest one there. And to finally close us off, break the rules once in a while. I think that's a really nice one to end on, isn't it, Mike? Because at the end of the day, we all need that moment occasionally for a special occasion, food, uh, just to treat ourselves. Mm. So just a reminder before we play you the last clip from Michael Pollan, the big question for today's show is what is one food and diet habit you want to change? And I hope that those food rules gave a lot of inspiration. It sounds like you and I need to take our time and stop before we're full that 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 could be (laughs) that could be one for us right yeah and i'm really really interested to hear from you our listeners on what diet habit you you're looking to change so again get in touch with us on twitter instagram youtube leave us a comment because we'd love to hear from you as well that's right just head to moonshots.io and you can find all the gazillion and million different ways of connecting to the show but to round this show out I think it is only appropriate that we hear from Michael making his final case for the title of his book, Why We Need to Defend Food. Had a series of events over the last several decades that I think have uh, alerted people to the fact that maybe they should pay a little more attention to where the food comes from. We had mad cow disease. That was, a, that was a, a, an amazing moment, a teachable moment in a way. Um, it was limited to Europe for the most part. There were a couple cases here. Um, but suddenly we learned that, wait a minute, we're feeding cows to cows? They, you know, don't they eat grass and grain? And, um, and so we learned something. And then the demand for organic meat uh, soared. We had um, various food safety scandals involving fast food, which also increased interest in alternatives. That's a big one here, Listeria. Yeah, that's right, Maple Leaf the Listeria case. And we had um, the Alar case with apples in America in the 90s, which suddenly people were like, panic for organic was the headline in Newsweek magazine. Um, so every time the industrial food system has a scandal like that, interest in alternatives and curiosity about the source of food grows. But it never lasts. It takes well, almost, it, it takes just a little bit of advertising to get us to go back to square one. It, it feels like anyway. Yeah, well, you know, the stories go away, but look at the, the growth in the alternative markets. Since 1990, when organic really gets started, uh, that, that segment has grown 20% a year, uh, even through this recession. Uh, organic food growth rates went down, but it continued to grow at about 10% a year. 
Um, local food is the fastest growing segment in the food system. Um, I'm talking about you know uh, local farms to institutions and also farmers markets and CSAs. So the continuing expansion of alternative of the alternative food economy suggests that this is not completely forgotten. That people have had their consciousness raised about food, and it's convinced many people, not everybody, and still a, only just a segment, that it's worth paying more for food you know more about. Defend it and protect it. Really consider what it is that you're purchasing and where you're purchasing. Because at the end of the day, as we've heard from Michael throughout this show, Mike, as well as in his book, In Defense of Food, there are times when our decision making has kind of been made for us. So rather than fall into that camp of being convinced that you need to go out and buy that probiotic yogurt, the truth is it has almost as much Coca Cola uh, as much sugar as there is in Coca-Cola. I think this is a great wake up call for me. Mm. It really is. It's, it's, it's about the intentionality. Um, it's a, it's a story of taking control and putting inside of yourself good stuff so you can feel good and don't underestimate the tricks that we can fall for. I mean, oh my gosh, organic yogurt that has more sugar than Coke. <laughs> Back in the day, protein was evil. Now it's the savior. Like just take a step back, enjoy this perspective of Michael Pollan. And I think it's really transformational, isn't it? It's really, really transformational. And I think the important connection that I can see as we reflect on our health series, again, it's just down to ownership. We can control what we're purchasing and cooking. Absolutely true. So Mark, I got to hit you with the big question. What is the one singular food and diet habit that you want to change now that we've dug into Michael Pollan's work? It's really, again, coming back to Michael's mantra, you know, not too much. I tend to eat yeah. pretty good, quite healthy food most of the time, but I definitely gorge until I'm getting into that lethargic, <laughs> lazy, sleepy space. <laughs> food coma. Exactly. That's oh the gosh. thing, the diet change and habit that I'd look to to amend going forward. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm similar. I think my thing was always like, like, oh, I should eat a ton to fuel me. Um, yeah. And it's a misconception. Um, it's very powerful stuff, isn't it, Mike? It's very, very powerful stuff. And I'm pleased that we got to dig into in defense of food today with you, our listeners. It's been great. Yeah, it has really been a treat. So thank you to you, Mark. And thank you to you, our listeners. Thank you for all your feedback, your shout outs, your membership, your support. We truly do appreciate it. And we are very grateful as we are grateful for the work of Michael Pollan here on show 158, the book In Defense of Food. And Michael came out hard and strong with his mantra, eat food, mostly plants, not too much. Because we live in this age of nutritionalism where others are telling us how to eat, where they're hooking us with the new fad, leading us astray. His call to us is take control because eating is a key part of your health and feeling good. So you must understand that the modern Western diet has failed, where we fall for organic yogurt that has more sugar than Coke, where this and that fad are controlling us. We need to defend food. We need to be intentional. We need to take control. Good food that makes us feel good. That is the celebration that we've had here together in the Moonshots podcast. That's a wrap.